And then they threw all kinds of other tech at me. And, and Canvas, let me tell you, Canvas is not user-friendly um, in terms of setting up all that testing and everything. I've learned a lot. All right. So um, what I am going to have you guys accountable to is, um, and what NCLEX is going to have you guys accountable to, is um, these two triage things, START and ESI, um, which basically, not that you're going to be proficient at it, but that you have an idea of the two, the, the determining factors of how these work. Um, START triage is very simple triage. It's the one that if you've done the, um, uh, the disaster day scenario or the TNP critical care, the uh, turbulence guy, uh, you got to disaster triage a couple of people and practice with that. Um, and then the second one, the Swift River ER, you're doing the ESI triage, the numbers one through five. So if you did um, muddle through that assignment, um, you have an idea and you've probably learned just by doing how these things work. So we're going to show you the first one. This one is the probably the one that if you're going to get specific um, questions on, um, on the exam, <clears throat> they will probably be this kind of question. Um, in categorizing people very quickly, red, yellow, green, or black. Um, if you're doing this in an ED, you're never going to triage people black, hopefully. Um, this is for field triage after a disaster scenario. Um, but the ED is kind of, some of the EDs are set up off of the system. Um, you probably see most EDs, if you've had a chance to go to an ED, have, um, have a coloring code system of some kind. I know um, Chandler's ED is set up red, yellow, green. Um, green is non-emergent people that basically can wait. Urgent care. Um, yellow are people that definitely have injuries. And red is life-threatening injuries. Now, they kind of set it up in the actual ED a little bit differently, that green is more urgent care, yellow is we need to do a couple of tests, use a couple of resources, and red is probably going to be admitted or need more resources. Um, but that is a basic, uh, the color code system, which you did get to play with in the Turbulent Sky scenario. Um, this is another, this is the actual uh, physical decision tree on how to get people, especially if you show up on a... Uh, on a scene of, let's say, an accident. You know, if you show up and pull off to the side of the road and are behind, you know, a three-car accident and you have multiple people, you will do this kind of even internally in your head without even thinking about it. But there is a literal decision tree. Um, if someone has gotten out of the car and walking, you go ahead and move them over to green and you start looking at other people in the scenario. Um, and basically, this is to decide how to treat people first to make sure that people that need the resources are going to get the care first. So if you, um, I have a couple of um, scenarios that I will probably put up just for practice. I have the scenarios and the answers keys from the actual trauma uh, scenario book from the ATLS, the um, Advanced Trauma Life Support uh, class. And uh, they will... They go through, it gives you a scene like a car accident, a bomb blast, or you're showing up, um, you know, at the scene of some large accident. You can start immediately helping out. So if someone has gotten out of the car, um, we're going to make them minor. They could have other injuries, but while you're trying to deal with maybe five or ten victims, um, you want to make sure that the people who need it get it. So... What you're going to do is if they're able to walk, you kind of discount them, put them down, sit them down over on the ground, and then um, go and look at all the rest of the people involved. Um, you're checking them for, hey, guess what? This is A, B, C, D. Um, you're checking them for breathing first. Um, if they are not breathing appropriately, which they do classify as a respiratory rate of greater than 30. Um, if the patient is breathing, then you keep moving on. You check the respiratory rate. If they're greater than 30, you're going to go ahead and make sure that they're going to get care because something's not quite right. If the respiratory rate's less than 30, then you check for a pulse, check for cap refill. Um, you're checking to make sure that perfusion is working adequately. If perfusion is not working adequately, then they move on to red. And then you check D, A, B, C, D, and we call... Um, 
If anybody has a good monomic for D, I call it delirium, which makes me think of the brain. Um, but basically checking their mental status is the D part of it. So A, B, C, D. And um, if you pass A, B, C, D, mental status, you can obey commands, then you move to yellow. So let's say someone has, um, you show up at a car accident and we have two people, let's say we have six victims. Two are out of the car walking around. Um, one is trapped behind the driver's wheel. Um, one is the passenger in a car and one is um, in the back seat of the second car. So we have two out, let's say five victims because that's all I can come up with. Two out of the car, one behind the driver's wheel, one in the passenger seat, and one in the back seat. So we go and talk, we take the two, put them over to green because they're walking, they're out of the car walking. It does not matter if you think they might have other injuries, they are moving so they move to green while you're first assessing. We go to the one behind the steering wheel. The one behind the steering wheel has a respiratory rate of six. What do we give them? Do we move on to the next patient? Do we move on to another category? So Brad, you say respiratory rate is six. We're gonna go ahead and give them immediate, but you said respiratory rate less than 30, Diana. What's going on? Why did you give them immediate, Brad? Exactly, so Brad did point out 12 is the minimum respiratory rate. So he did not pass spontaneous breathing. So that's something that I wanted to put out there. Um, spontaneous breathing, you have to say, this isn't just existence of breathing. This is whether you classify this patient as having enough spontaneous breathing to perfuse or to, um, to adequately oxygenate the body. So with a respiratory rate of six, that is beneath our normal parameter for good spontaneous breathing. So, you know, they're trying to keep this chart very simple here, but spontaneous breathing should be, you know, six to 30. Less, or 10, sorry, our regular respiratory rate is 10 to 12, right? So anything less than 10, we need to stop. We're not done with the airway. So we're not gonna go on to perfusion at this point. We put him, six could be agonal, six could be, um, maybe they're, they've got their chest, maybe they've broken their neck. We don't know. You got to reposition their airway, see if we get his respiratory rate up. So what we can do on that patient is we do not move on to the other patients. We have, a, we have an immediate right there on our first one. So the other patients have to kind of, you know, you have an immediate. So what you have to do in this situation is if there is someone else with you, you can stay with this patient. If you are going around to look at all the other patients, this patient would be sitting there at the cusp of immediate or expectant. We're not really sure. Let's run around the other side of the car. This patient needs care, but I'm the only one at the scene. So we're going to go and take a look at the other patients at this point. So we can reposition this patient's airway. At this point, I would want someone to be holding this person's head. I don't know what happened to them in the scene. I don't know if they've got a broken neck, but we have to try and get them breathing. Otherwise, everything else we do is going to be pointless. So this guy at six behind the steering wheel is someone that we are definitely immediate with. And I wanted to point that out, that he is spontaneously breathing, but it's not sufficient. So um, if you had someone else with you, this is where I would probably try to mobilize their head, reposition the airway, and then move around and double check the other people. So let's say we had a second person in the car. I've got them staying with this adequate, this guy of six right now, he's immediate. Let me go around and check the um, passenger. The passenger is talking, crying, um, but both legs have a deformity. Both legs look like they've been crushed. The, the ankles are facing the wrong way. Where would we put this patient? Respiratory rate on this patient, quickly you can tell, is um, you do a quick four second, five second check, and the respiratory rate is 24. Radial pulse is present. They are talking and crying. You ask them, can they move? 
and they say, no, they don't think so. Can they feel their feet? No, they don't think so. What color do we give them? Yes, you give them yellow. The legs don't look good. They don't look good. We don't know what's going on. Certainly worse could be happening, but this patient passes respiratory rate, perfusion, and mental status. He can at least talk to you and answer your questions, yellow. So then we go to the backseat passenger. Backseat passenger is got a respiratory rate of 42. Weak palpable pulses. So you have two immediate patients, exactly. You've got two immediate patients. So now when someone shows up on the scene, which one do you go to first? The driver, exactly. The driver's got the respiratory rate of six. The other patient does have severe injuries, but has a respiratory rate. He has a weak palpable pulse. His perfusion's not intact, but his respiratory system does classify him as immediate, but he is breathing better than the first one. And we have to keep the first one from going from immediate to expectant, which is where he loses his respiratory rate. So at this point, you would probably um, keep an eye on both of them for the best of your ability um, to give a report to EMS when they arrive. Um, we'll talk about what we would do for the C-spine patient next week. Um, but basically, how would, you, how would you take care of this patient in the front of the car? Just curious. Not that that's going to be on the test. But what would you do if you showed up on this scene? Not Brad. Brad knows what he would do when he shows up on this scene. Yep, leave them in the car, immobilize their head. Um, if you happen to be probably a medic that keeps a bag valve mask, you could try to oxygenate them. Otherwise, yes, stabilize the head and um, stay with that patient. Keep counting the respirations. You don't need to do mouth-to-mouth um, -mouth on this one. But then that way, when EMS shows up, you have enough ability to say this one first. This one first because the respirations are six and um, you can kind of keep talking to the patient, seeing you can do your further perfusion assessment while you've got someone holding the head. Maybe you could check, see if there's a little cap refill or maybe whether they have a pulse. Um, you can do a little bit more assessment, but you're going to stay with the person that has the lower rest rate because he's closer to expectant. Now let's say while you're holding C-spine on him, you notice his respiratory rate going down and down and down. Now what do we do? He's now apneic as you're holding his head. Now what do we do? And it may seem weird and bad but you leave him and now you go to the back seat passenger. Exactly. So it gives you an idea of where to spend your limited resources. You're only you. You can only save a few and you're not going to spend time stopping, dropping the seat of the car, trying to do CPR on this first person when you have another person in the back that is alive and possibly has something that you can take a look at. So that was just kind of a quick um, idea of what the start triage looks like. And yes, um, it's hard to move on from a patient, but when you only have yourself as a resource, you are trying to help those in most need and then moving on. So yes, now we can, we can give a little shout out to our um, scene people um, who do show up on scenes like this and have to make these decisions. Um, but this is how they do it. You're doing it with a, you know, with a stepwise process. Um, nobody's saying anything on this triage is easy. But um, red, yellow, green. Um, so you would think that someone shows up with two crushed legs and bleeding out from their legs and that you would want to talk to them. But they're actually at the bottom of your list because you've got two, two reds in front of you. 
And um, yes, we do have to sometimes make those decisions and that's what um, leads us to make decent, calm, rational decisions versus, um, you know, oh, this one looks funny. And when you take the, um, if you take um, the ATLS or the, um, any of the trauma certifications, the trauma nurse um, certification or the advanced trauma life support, um, they will try to distract you with um, horrible, gory injuries because, of course, you want to help people with horrible, gory, bleeding out injuries. But if you miss the patient with a respiratory um, to go and see someone with a gory, bleeding out injury, um, they actually make you repeat the scenario again. Um, they really try to train you on that respiratory goes first. So anyway, real brief there on red, yellow, and green. And basically, it's A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, E. I mean, ABCD gets you your red, yellow, and green. Um, so if you pass ABCD, you're yellow automatically. If you don't pass ABC, then you are red. So there we go. Um, ER throws a few more questions into it. And if you did the Swift River one, um, you probably got to triage about 20 patients. And um, they were giving them numbers one through five. And so this is the ESI triage, which is what you were practicing in that Swift River. And you can go back at any point and do those now that you're done with the actual turning in of the assignment, or if you have to go turn in the, or you have to go do the assignment still, this is a fun one to practice um, the triaging with. Um, those two assignments are great for triaging. And um, anyway, the one through five was probably a little more challenging for people. How did you guys do starting out with it? Anyone who's done it. Did you like it? Was it hard? Were you making random guesses? You got 70 patients? Wow. Oh, got a 70 score. Oh, I was like, oh my God, you scored 70 patients? Um, but the thing is, is that yes, you will get hands-on practice. I mean, I can show you this slide and you can study the slide um, as much as you want, but it's very different than just actually having patients kind of come at you and having to give them a number score. And um, I just think that scenario, when I played with it, I was like, wow, I can't teach triage better than this. Um, and that would be equivalent to sitting with the triage nurse for a couple of hours, um, probably not even a couple hours. You probably have to sit for a whole day with a triage nurse to get that many um, patients kind of coming in. So it was, I thought, a very amazing um, chance to do this. And that would be a great way to study if you wanted to. But I'm probably not going to have you rate people one through five on the exam. Um, you know, really, you're not going to be a proficient triage nurse. I just want you to be proficient with the kinds of things that are on the triage. Um, I would love for you guys to know these danger vital signs. So when you were doing that scenario, if you had this in front of you, you probably triaged people correctly more than you triaged them incorrectly if you were just guessing. Um, but this is how they do it. Um, a, B, C, D, of course, will get you number one, get you level one. Um, if the patient started becoming um, like what looked like perfusion or had severe pain or needed some more treatments, they would kind of get to two and then it kind of went into how many resources were needed do they need chest x-rays do they need labs do they need um maybe just a simple suture maybe you know that's how many resources they were looking at um and they triaged you know into those categories by that way so basically they do a b c d of course level one and then they start looking at the patient now we would look at our fractured patient the lie with the two fractured legs where do you think we would put him? What level, when he arrived to the ED, would they put our patient who was alert, oriented, talking, um, but couldn't feel his feet? I hear, I got twos and threes. Um, this patient would probably get a two under distress. Even though he couldn't feel his feet, um, he would have uh, probably danger zone vital signs, so I would put him at two or three, and because he's got bilateral extremities, 
with um, deformities, he's going to need the OR and some tests prior to going to the OR. And he's probably going to need the OR quickly. So I'd probably put him a two, which you could see is kind of a judgment call for a triage nurse. Um, it would depend on what's going on in the ED. I mean, two, you know, that's what I like that Swift River aviation, you know, rip, um, thing is that you had to kind of decide too, based on what you triaged them, uh, where you would put them and when you could get them seen. Um, this patient, I would probably put a two just because of the extent of his injuries, but technically a three would be appropriate as well. Um, this, that patient would definitely need to go to the OR sooner rather than later. He's got nerve damage and would need to get those legs splinted. He's getting, um, he would be using a lot of resources, um, but he probably also has those danger zone vital signs, which are not, um, anything extraordinary. It's a heart rate greater than 100 and a respiratory rate greater than 20. It won't be hard to hit danger zone vital signs on many, many people. Um, so he's probably, oh yeah, so basically the um, adult one's at the very bottom. So, uh, you know, again, I'm not pediatrics, so I don't look at the other lines. Um, the bottom one is uh, the adult. So, um, yeah, their ages. <laughs> so, um, basically they're just kind of, con you know, kind of going for your normals, um, for your pediatric patients and what's above normal for the pediatric patients. So that actually might be useful if you need to review peds too. uh, your danger zone vital signs are, um, that's just a useful little, um, square of paper. Um, and then for any of those patients in any year, the O2 sat less than 92. So you could be th less than three months, and if you got a sat of 90, you qualify for danger zone vital signs. Um, so when I had my pneumonia, um, and I was thinking about whether I go to the OR, I, I mean to the ED, to get it treated, I realized I had danger zone vital signs. So I did need to go get treated. I went to urgent care anyway. But um, it's kind of just a, a quick little thing. I mean, if your heart rate's greater than 100, your respiratory rate's greater than 20, your SATs are less than 92, you need to go get treated. They are typically danger zone vital signs. So if you have any of these um, vital signs, you're going to get attention quicker in the ED. Now, if your heart rate is um, 110, but your respiratory rate is 10, and your SATs are 96, you have one danger zone vital sign, but not anything else. They'll probably start looking at maybe what resources do you need. But if you have all three, um, you are definitely level three. So I'm not going to have you actually triage people on the test and say what number they're going to be. But I would like you to kind of have an idea of ESI triage is one through five and that it, it combines resources, vital signs, and the ABCD. Um, that's all I really, but I really just loved those, um, that Swift River one to go back and practice with, um, just so that you can actually utilize it and, you know, go to clinical with your, um, with your ESI triage. So basically we kind of talked about ABCD already. Um, it's all considered a primary survey. Um, I will ask you to know the difference between a, what's in a primary survey and a secondary survey. Um, anything that is just a quick look at a patient, um, which is basically airway, breathing, pulses, circulation, disability. And I'm not talking about a full neuro exam like you had to do for neuro. I'm not talking about the cranial nerve exam. I'm talking about do they follow commands. Primary survey is something that you can do in less than two minutes, okay? I want you to just make sure they're breathing, get a respiratory rate, check a pulse, ask if they can, you know, ask them a few basic questions to see if they're following commands. So really it is respiratory rate, pulse, and commands, okay? And then this is where if you think there is some bleeding or something going on or you see an injury, this is basically un undressing them, not completely stripping them down, um, but getting them to the point where you can take a look at some areas of concern. And that is basically the A, B, C, D, E. Um, this is what we're doing where we stop here if we're having problems. So if your pulse and cap refill are not great, you're in the circulation section. If your breathing is not great, you're in the breathing section, your um, airway you're not maintaining. Um, all those things will stop you there. You will not go on to doing a secondary survey until you get things straight in your primary survey. So primary survey can be done less than a minute 
um, and it is rudimentary stuff. It's really just looking at the breathing, checking the respiratory rate, checking for pulses, um, checking for cap refill, and checking for following commands. Um, exposure is basically getting the patient to, so, to see if you can see anything that's of concern. So when a patient arrives in the ED, first thing they're going to be doing is a primary survey, but it's done in less than a minute. Then we go in and do a secondary survey. So if you've made it to triage and they're taking your, um, your vital signs and doing other, they're already into the secondary survey. Most of our assessments and um, exam and doing more detailed questioning is going to fall into the secondary survey. Um, and we don't go into the secondary survey until our patient is A, B, C, D under control. Okay, so if this patient is bleeding out from something, you are, and I'm not good. Remember, this is nursing school. We put fine, we put lines between everything. I know when you're in an ED trauma room, because I've seen them, that they are still trying to stop some bleeding and you've got people asking them if they got allergies medications last meal. So, um, but technically it does not belong in the first few assessments. Once they're stabilized, you can do all the rest of these things. And stabilized means breathing adequately with an adequate respiratory rate um, and they have a pulse, circulation, adequate circulation, and then they have um, their following commands. If you don't have any of those things, you're kind of stuck in fixing the ABCD before you can really go on to the secondary survey. And some people are like, all right, well, this patient has a, a brain injury. Um, let's say they had a, um, a fall from a ladder and they have a broken leg, a broken arm, and um, what looks like a head bleed. So you go in and you do the ABC. Airway breathing, they're okay. They're breathing, their respiratory rate's 30, their O2 sats are 89. You put them on some oxygen and now they're up to 94. So we've got airway and breathing under control. Now we're in circulation. We're looking at the broken arm, broken leg, don't see any outright bleeding. Um, we're looking at the head, the patient's not following commands. He's unconscious. Looks like he's got a head bleed. Yes, from here on, we will probably start doing, we've, we've, ass we've assessed it. We can see why they're not following commands. We see the reason, and then we go into the secondary survey to figure out what's going on with the head. But we're staying with the head. We leave the broken arm and the broken leg alone for right now. Guess where he's going next? Where is he going for the secondary survey? Your unconscious head trauma. Yep, he's headed right to the CT scanner. Um, the patient is unconscious. We can't get him out of D. We have to investigate D. What is going on here? He doesn't have respiratory reasons to be unconscious. He does not seem to have circulatory reasons. He's got pulses. He does have a broken arm and a broken leg, but we can't leave D. So now we're going to go into the secondary survey with D. So everybody wants it linear, like, oh, A, B, C, D, okay, now we're going to go to our head to toe. and our No, we're still stuck in diagnosing or figuring out D. So they will go in and start doing secondary survey focused just on D, on the brain. He's getting a secondary survey focused just on the brain. Once those diagnostics have been done, then we can bring him back out and do the full rest of the secondary survey. Does that make sense? So let's say we have another patient coming in that um, is uh, been stabbed, stabbed in the, stabbed in the abdomen. So we have our patient has a, a respiratory rate of 36, um, SATs are 95. Um, circulation wise though, weak thready pulses. We end up doing a set of vital signs to see what his blood pressure is. His blood pressure is 80 over 40. We have moved, we stopped at circulation, okay? 
yes, we are suspecting he's got an internal bleed or something wrong with his valleys. There is something wrong circulation-wise, okay? We cleared his AB because he's got a decent sat and he's breathing. But C is no bueno. Yes, C's not, B's not great because his respiratory rate's 30. Um, and we'll get him oxygen for that. And then we get stuck in C. So our secondary survey, we're stuck in C. So yes, we will do more secondary survey, but that includes getting a blood pressure, maybe examining the belly, um, trying to find if there is a entry exit wound, looking for signs of blood, and they will go in and do an abdominal assessment. But we're going to stay with our area of concern, which is C. So then we move into a secondary assessment. So what I'm saying is you do your primary survey. If you find A, B, C are, um, so primary survey, yes, excellent. Sets up priorities for your secondary survey. Good job, Sandra. I love that. I might actually use that. Because if your A and B are messed up, you start doing your secondary survey around your lungs. If your C is messed up, you're going to do your secondary survey around areas where you think you are losing blood or causing you to have circulation problems. Maybe there's something wrong with your heart, but basically you go into your secondary survey around those areas. If you're unconscious, you're going to go into your secondary survey around there, but you're not going to go into a full head to toe. On a patient with an ABCD priority, we're not going into a full entire, um, you know, image, you know, Let's do a full head to toe. Let's turn them back and forth. Let's look head to toe for physical injuries. We're in A, B, C, D. So if we have our abdominal patient, we are going to do images and lab studies around that C problem, our circulation problem. What is causing our low blood pressure? We have to find the source of that low blood pressure. So you'll be doing your secondary survey around that. On our unconscious patient, you're going to be doing your secondary survey around that unconsciousness, the Glasgow Coma Scale, the CT scan. Um, we put the head to toe, and the ED kind of puts head to toe a little bit behind the ABCD. So yeah, I would say that that's probably a very good characteristics of how we use primary and secondary, um, is that primary, you're just looking to clear ABCD. If you can't, you go into your secondary around that. If you've cleared ABCD, um, so for our double leg trauma patient, he cleared ABCD. So now we can do a full head to sew, a physical exam, ask him more questions, draw labs, talk to him about the allergies, medications, past medical history. And probably the one thing testable um, is on this is basically, um, you know, that secondary survey includes anything other than quick look at the patient. Um, it is usually directed around what our priorities were and that the history, um, the important history that you need from the patient. So if the important history is last surgical history, no, we don't see that in there. The history that we are gathering from them is, are you allergic to anything? Are you on medications? Are you pregnant? Is there anything going on, you know, in your current, you know, when did you eat last? And last meal is so that if you have to have anything, um, any surgical interventions, the anesthesiologist will know how likely it is that they're going to aspirate. Um, and then environment of injury, this is talking about what happened when you got injury, injured. So um, environment of injury could be, you know, what did the car accident look like? Were there two or three cars involved? Were there any fatalities at the scene? That clues us in that this is, you know, a much bigger problem. Maybe someone's coming in completely asymptomatic, but the environment of injury was so intense that we're going to keep an eye on them a little closer. Um, you know, did this patient fall? Was there something else involved? Um, you know, there's a lot of things you want to ask about the the area where they got injured, you know, where there are toxic substances around. You'll have to find out a little bit more about the scene and this is where we can ask the patient or we can ask anybody that came in with it. So I'm sure any of our medics or EMTs are very well aware that they end up giving a lot of the history if they could get it from the family at the scene and then bring it into the ED. But what I wanna point out about secondary survey is that it is anything other than the quick look at the patient. It's usually um, 
if it if you do have an ABCD problem, the secondary survey is around that ABCD problem, and then we can figure out the rest of the head to toe. If they do not have an ABCD problem, then we can go through and um, start doing head to toes and more thorough secondary survey. So I think that's all I have to say on the primary and secondary survey. Um, I'm not testing you at trauma center levels. I think it's just nice to know information. Um, so I'm going to skip through that. And then these you've already had. Um, we've already talked about most of these things. But I did want to point out the these are things that keep you in ABC. They don't let you move out of ABC. And if you miss um, when you're taking your ATLS and you miss... Uh, the hemothorax, um, and you go into treating a massive femur fracture, they fail you because these are um, things that keep you in ABC. And so, yeah, they will, they throw all kinds of distractors at you that are really gory and really gross, but you're not allowed to touch them until you've cleared them for any of these major thoracic traumas. Um, so this section just goes over things. We talked about pneumos and hemos just for the last test. Um, foil chest is basically broken ribs and cardiac tamponade we kind of talked about. So this goes over again. Um, they got you on that. Did you take ATLS, Blake? Or ACLS? Just curious. Oh, okay. Yeah, they don't want you coming out of that ABC. They're training your brain. We start training your brain. Um, and then if you start taking any of these advanced certifications, um, they will train your brain even further to not get out of this ABC. So if you see any signs and symptoms, so if I give you a scenario of a patient um, that has any signs and symptoms of a thoracic trauma, I would want you to identify them and treat them first. So there will be some prioritization on the exam where I give you a couple of different patients and I would like you to, you know, make sure that you understand which ones go first um, in terms of treatment. Um, so tension pneumo, um, again, would be diminished breath sounds on your entire side. So if you're listening to this, um, if you see tracheal deviation, this is a tension pneumo. This isn't just a plain pneumothorax. This is a tension pneumothorax, something that is getting um, worse as you breathe. Um, so asymmetrical chest rise, tracheal deviation, um, tachycardia and hypotension, because look at what's happening to that heart. It's getting pushed over. It can't um, get fluid out very well because now all these, uh, the aorta is getting squished. Everything's getting squished. Um, so if you see any of these signs, of course you're not moving out of ABC. Something's not quite right. Um, you would put your, your stethoscope on and confirm no breath sounds on this patient right here, the right side. What's causing it here is you can see there's a major hole in the lung, if you could see where the little um, the little arrows are. And every time they take a breath in, it just puts more air into the empty space and starts squishing and squishing and squishing everything over. Um, the treatment for it is a decompression, not that you can do a decompression, um, but this is basically where they stick a needle in the chest and let, that, and let the air all out. It's basically a field chest tube. Um, chest tube, of course, is the, the good, quick, um, the, the one that you can leave in, but um, I do have a video here. I'm not going to show it right now, but if you want to go to this video, you can actually see them doing a needle decompression. Um, the important thing is, though, you need to do what we were talking about in the, uh, in the uh, pneumothorax lecture. If they put a needle into the chest here to get air out, what do you think needs to be on the end of the needle? My EMS people, yes, a syringe full of water to give you a water seal. Otherwise, when this patient breathes in, they're going to um, inhale more air and you're just undoing what you've just done. So basically, you are allowing them, uh, sorry, when they inhale, they will um, blow air out. And when they exhale, they will pull air in if you don't have water on it. So you want to have water on it for a water seal. Um, I'll let you watch the video on decompression. It's a fun video. Open pneumar, we already talked about. This is what happens when your chest tube comes out or you get shot or stabbed in the chest. This is why they always say um, 
if you have been impaled on something or you have something in your chest or in your, don't pull it out because as soon as you pull it out, you're going to cause bleeding. And if it is in your lung space, um, you will end up with a um, open pneumothorax. Um, but gunshot wounds, any penetrating injury to the chest can cause an open pneumo. And that is just a hole in the chest where air is leaking, leaking out. But also every time you um, exhale, air is getting pulled into the chest. You couldn't get the link to work? All right, I won't. Let me just see if I can get it to work. You know what? I wonder. Don't seem to be available anymore. All right. I will find you. Okay. Thanks. I will find you um, the links. I'll, I'll research that and I'll post the links um, in an announcement. So thanks for letting me know. I'll, I'll find, you know, I guess YouTube, man, they keep changing them. So I will find a good one. Um, but anyway, what's the treatment for an open pneumo or a pulled out chest tube? Well, you're seeing it right in front of you. Yes, three-way dressing. Um, this patient has just a little opening there in the little corner, um, but a three-way dressing is appropriate because when you inhale and that lung expands, it will push air out of the chest if it has somewhere to go. But then you want something so that when they suck, um, when they exhale and that lung gets smaller, they don't suck air into the chest. So basically a three-sided um, three-sided dressing for an open pneumo. Uh, massive hemothorax. Um, this one too, um, this would be the same sorts of signs and symptoms as a pneumo, but the reason is because of blood. You'll actually probably, um, they can percuss it, but um, there's usually probably an injury that they, you, if they have broken ribs, um, it could easily be a pneumo or a hemo, but what they will do is it's still the same treatments as a massive um, pneumothorax, you can immediately decompress it with a needle with um, water on the end. Um, but then when you put the needle in there and you're expecting air and blood starts spurting out of it, well, now you know you have a hemothorax. Um, but anyway, you can decompress it. You can remove the blood that way. You can put it in the chest tube. Um, one of the things, though, that we do say if you do have a massive hemothorax is that um, you'll notify the provider if there's more than 500 milliliters out. One, that's a lot of fluid. But two, um, if you drop that much fluid out of the chest, what we see happen is that sometimes that fluid, that blood that was sitting in the lung was actually tamponading or holding pressure on a bleeding vessel. And then when we pull the blood out of that space, it starts to bleed again. So um, what they'll do is that's the one time you'll get an order usually to clamp the chest tube is if you are bleeding massively. Because if you put in a chest tube and 500 cc's dumps out and you keep bleeding, well, all you're doing is you're vacuuming out the blood, but you're going to continue to bleed. And so the only time they will clamp the chest tube is when you have a massive hemo because what they will do is let it out in little bits, but they will keep the blood in the chest to hold pressure on that bleeder until they can get into the OR to fix it. So, um, but again, don't clamp a chest tube on your own. Um, let somebody know and get the order to clamp a chest tube because really you don't want to clamp a chest tube and stop drainage of something that needs to be drained, but you do want to let somebody know. And I wanted to let you know so that you have that on your thing that more than 500 milliliters out um, in the first, right after they put the chest tube in, is a sign that there's a massive hemothorax and they might want to clamp the chest tube, but you're not going to make that decision on your own. Um, yeah, we've seen people, they'll put in the chest tube and dump out, but guess what they're going to have problems with after they lose all that blood is their blood pressure. So the reason we clamp the chest tube is to hold, we can't hold pressure on the lung ourselves with our hands, so we will use that blood to hold pressure on a bleeder um, internally. So just clarify that um, for the doc, but definitely um, if there's a ton of blood coming out of the chest tube, you would um, that would be one of your choices is to clamp the chest tube, but I would um, want to clarify that before I did that. So anyway, um, that's hemothorax. Flailed chest is um, basically a set of ribs that have been broken, um, and they are moving separate from the rest of your rib cage. Um, so that when you inhale, 
and your rib cage is opening, um, it actually gets kind of sucked in. And the reason that this is dangerous is that paradoxical chest movement, and I will try to get the link, I'll try and find a link for it. Paradoxical chest movement just means that when one side of your chest is rising, the side with the broken ribs is sinking. So something's not quite right. You can usually see it um, visibly when you're trying to do your assessment, when you're doing your ABC assessment. You're like, that's not right. And you're like, is it asymmetrical or is it paradoxical? Asymmetrical means one side rises, the other side doesn't do anything. Um, so you've got your chest rising on your left side, but nothing's happening on your right side. Paradoxical would be the left side rises and the right side sinks in. Um, it is, and one of the reasons we worry about this is that um, these free floating ribs just hanging out there, getting sucked into the lung and out of the lung, um, are gonna cause pneumothoraxes. Um, so what they have to do is um, they will put on positive pressure ventilation. Are we still waiting for a hemo demo? I don't have a hemo, you mean like a, oh, a hemodynamics? Oh, I could give you one, but it wasn't, um, it's not going to be required for testing. No, Nate, I'm not, um, the hemodynamics was just to show you how to set up an A-line and a CVP and all that. And I, I can try to get to it. I was just worried about getting your test out in time. Um, but yeah, that one could be just for some, I would like to do one because I think it would be interesting for you, but not testable. Um, so it wasn't high on my priority list. It was down in the green section, and I had yellow and red things going on. So um, I, I will try to get to it this semester. I'd love to do it. I usually do do a hemodynamics demo. Um, but anyway, so this patient, we will splint them. We'll splint their chest with positive pressure ventilation. So this way, if we're putting air into the lungs and kind of keeping those lungs popped open, the um, empty piece of ribs doesn't um, doesn't move in and out as much, um, but usually 100%, uh, well, not 100%, not guaranteed 100%, it would depend on their SATs, but oxygen and positive pressure ventilation um, will help kind of splint that um, ribs. Now, I, I don't need, <laughs> you're working harder than I am, no matter how hard I work, I know you guys are working harder trying to understand all this, um, so I appreciate the sentiment. Um, I just feel bad for you guys this semester. Um, but anyway, so flailed chest, we want you to recognize it as a concerning condition that does need treatment because it will cause worse problems if we don't get through it. It is a breathing issue. So I would want you to recognize it and really paradoxical chest movement for flailed chest. And the last one is tamponade, which we talked about. And um, I don't think I mentioned the Bex triad, which you probably maybe have seen in some of your prep use questions. Um, because I wasn't really focusing on tamponade in the um, cardiac lecture there. It's, it's one of the side effects of pericarditis, um, but it happens much more often in, um, in blunt force trauma to the chest or trauma to the chest. So I put it here under trauma, um, that cardiac tamponade is basically where the heart is being so squished by blood building up in the sac. Now this is where if we've um, got a blunt chest injury, or maybe you hit the, the steering wheel, um, and you now are having blood filling in that pericardial sac, and it's causing that um, heart to squish. You're going to have pulsus paradoxus, which is pulsus paradoxus is a um, where whenever you take a breath in, your pulse rate slows down, and when you breathe out, your pulse rate goes faster. Some people have a pulsus paradoxus normally, um, usually small people with small chests. I used to qualify as a small person. I have some pulsus paradoxus where if you're taking a pulse, you will feel it kind of slow a little bit as you take a deep, deep breath because your heart's getting physically kind of squished a little bit by your lungs because you have a small chest. Here, pulsus paradoxus is much more distinct and that you will notice that the actual blood pressure will drop as you breathe in because your, your heart is being already squished and then when the lungs breathe in on top of it, it squishes it even more. So your blood pressure drops with an inspiration and kind of comes back up a little bit with an exhalation. That's the pulsus paradoxus. 
muffled heart sounds because you can't hear Lub Dub anymore because it's surrounded by blood. Um, JVD, jugular venous distension. Hey, you've got some heart failure going on and a decreased blood pressure. So right and left heart failure and um, muffled heart sounds. So if you see the word Bex triad, tri triad, oh my God, Bex triad goes with cardiac tamponade. Any questions on that? Narrowing pulse pressure, yes, is something, but it's very late. Um, if your patient is having narrow play, we're talking about like 80 over 60. Um, and so we're talking about, you know, 70 over 60. We're talking about something that's very narrow together. You'll probably see pulses paradoxus before you'll see narrowing pulse pressure. But yes, if you see that, um, that diastolic rising and the systolic dropping, um, it will go with decreased blood pressure. So you'll have decreased blood pressure. So I don't really, um, narrowing pulse pressure is a, is a yes, it is there 100%, but um, pulse is paradoxus is a little bit easier to see. Um, so I'll give you that one as your cues for tamponade. But just if you have a patient on any of your scenarios that exhibits massive pneumo or massive hemo, which is tracheal deviation, tachycardia, low blood pressure, um, or absent breath sounds on the entire side, those are things that are going to keep you in B. Um, if you have a flailed chest, paradoxical chest movement, that's going to keep you in B. If you have um, pulses, paradoxus, muffled heart sounds, decreasing blood pressure, um, JVD, that's cardiac tamponade, and that's going to keep you in C. So do we get, we, these are our B, C, these are our five things that are no-goes. Like you do not go into secondary survey, you stay right here, and your secondary survey is going to be around getting, the only thing you're probably going to be doing is heart rate and blood pressure. Um, because, and SATs, because you're really going to need to get rid of these B and C problems before you move on. Um, abdominal trauma, so there's so much that can happen in the abdomen, but I'm going to tell you there's only one thing that we need to know for abdominal trauma. Well, no, not one thing. There's a couple things. I would like you to know Gray Turner's Cullen's sign. Um, is the pulses paradoxus the drop more than 10? Um, I do believe, I would have to refer to your book to get the actual number, Blake. Um, I'm not going to quote a number right now because it'll probably be not what's in your book. So check your book on that one and go with your book on whatever the pulses paradoxus number is. Um, I don't want to get myself in a hole there. <laughs> so, um, but again, uh, if I don't know it off the top of my head, it's probably not going to be on testable, like what exactly it is. I give you a lot of cues to hopefully lead you to the right um, diagnosis. Um, these are things that are going to stop you about abdominal trauma. So for thoracic trauma, things that stopped us were absent breath sounds on a whole lobe, tracheal deviation, asymmetrical chest expansion, um, flail chest, paradoxical chest movement, and um, uh, yeah, the pulses paradoxus, muffled heart sounds, right and left heart failure. Those things will stop us and make us cue in to a thoracic problem. Here's things that will cue us into an abdominal trauma problem. And these are things that when our circulation, our breathing or circulation aren't quite right, and we are doing our little secondary survey around that, we can probably cue in on the causes of B and C problems right here. Um, so these are probably going to cause more circulation problems and breathing problems. But remember, our diaphragm is in the abdomen, so we can have problems with breathing from abdominal trauma as well. Um, Seatbelt sign, very obvious, is a the injury was so fast and furious that it caused this kind of bruising that we can see the seatbelt on their chest. High indication that there probably is some chest or um, abdominal trauma as well. Um, any bleeding, so here's Turner and Cullen's sign again. Cullen's is the C around the umbilicus, so bleeding around the umbilicus. Uh, where is Turner's sign is on your side or your flank. So we talked about it from, you know, remember kidney has, you know, pancreas. All those abdominal organs have Turner Cullen sign. So does abdominal trauma. Um, the, the Turner sign is the one down on the bottom there. Um, you got the patient there with a Turner sign along the back and then the other patient there along the flank. Um, if blood is going to be in the 
retroperitoneal area or basically um, where we would put um, peritoneal dialysis fluid, your belly can hold a ton of fluid. Um, so any bleeding into there, um, the fluid kind of collects up at the umbilicus and down towards the flank and the, um, and the back. So that's where if we have a C problem, we circulation, we have a low blood pressure, 330 pulse, we're really going to be, our, our major cues are going to be abdominal and thoracic trauma. We're looking for a reason for bleeding from those areas. Um, so we're looking for a hemothorax. We're looking for abdominal trauma. We're looking for turn, Turner Cullen sign. Um, if the patient also has pain uh, to the left shoulder, um, that could be um, diaphragm injury or bleeding in the um, abdomen that's displacing the diaphragm. Uh, so if you see Kerr's sign, that is a sign of, um, or pain in the left shoulder. They're not always having a heart attack. Sometimes there's something going on with the diaphragm. Um, but if you see any of these signs of bleeding, those would be worrisome. Um, you will probably be doing, and the one big difference here um, for our treatments is we know unconscious patients go to head CT and abdominal patients, hey, they can go to chest, they can go to abdominal CT. But something quicker and easier is this fast sonography. It's a quick ultrasound that you look in certain directions and you can see abdominal bleeding with it. I think it detects up, um, anything over 100 milliliters of abdominal bleeding. So you can do a fast scan. It's called fast. Focused assessment with sonography and trauma, a fast scan will tell you just as much as an abdominal CT and is not nearly as time consuming and um, you can do it right in the bay. So they can identify whether they um, are having abdominal bleeding um, right there. I got disconnected. One moment. Pause. Uh, so we were talking about the fast scan. And um, this, again, is super fast. Um, it is easily done. You can see the guy has his little handheld um, uh, scanner there. Um, done quick, done easy, much easier than abdominal CT scan. Um, can detect uh, blood uh, about 100 milliliters or more. Um, and the reason we want to detect this, so there are other more invasive interventions too that you can go into a paracentesis where you put a needle in the abdomen, see what drains out. Um, that's what a diagnostic peritoneal lavage is. Of course, if you get blood when you stick a needle in, um, hey, you got bleeding in there. Um, basically, you, it would be better to do it with a fast scan, but if you do not have a fast scanner, um, then abdominal CT. And then if you don't have a fast scanner or abdominal CT, um, then that's where they'll start putting needles into things to see if blood comes out. Um, again, we want to avoid any um, diagnostic peritoneal lavages or paracentesis if we can help it because that's going to cause more problems than um, just something quick and easy like a fast scan or a CT. But there are places that they're trying to stabilize people and we're an ABC and they do not have fast scanners and they do not have CT scanners um, and that's where they would go. And the reason we're checking for abdominal trauma is there's only one treatment for abdominal trauma and what do you think it is? Surgery. Sandra's got it. The only treatment for abdominal sur is surgery. Um, they might put in an NG tube, K, but that's only, um, it's really only going to pull air out of the stomach. Um, it's not going to really do anything about bleeding in the abdomen. Um, and what we're worried about with abdominal trauma is that something is uh, bleeding or um, there's other problems in there. So they're going to go to surgery. They're going to be first up for a surgery. Um, this one's just another screen on fast scanner because um, there might be a question on fast scanning. Um, but basically, this is probably the ideal um, for, for identifying abdominal trauma. So if you do a fast scan and there is blood in the abdomen, they will be um, going straight to surgery for an exploratory laparotomy to figure out what's going on. Um, so there's that. Let's take a quick little break. Do you want a quick little break? I need to, I'm going to take 10 minutes and do a bio break. So I'm going to pause here. Hang on. I forgot to start recording. Hang on. Let me go back out. Resume. Yes. Okay. 
So the reasons all these spinal cord slides were here, like I said, we're um, doing spinal cord injury next week. They were here because we um, trained you on how to log roll and how to do the C-spine collar so that you could actually do it during disaster day. Um, we're just, since disaster day got ruined, um, uh, you know, I can kind of go over a little bit about it, but again, we will spend more time on it next week. And if you were going through the voiceovers already, the spinal cord voiceover is not very good. I want to redo the spinal cord voiceover. Um, so I might take that one down just because I think I hurried through that last semester um, because we had spent so much time in the ED lecture on it that I kind of scurried through it. Um, but what I'm going to point out for ED uh, purposes is that basically if a patient comes in are the voiceovers the one you're talking about, the ones from last year? Yes. Um, I'm not updating them unless there was some flaws with them. Um, the ones from last semester aren't really that much different information from what I would give you anyway. So sometimes I send you to the voiceovers for more, um, more detailed information. Um, but if you're coming to the class here and watching these most recent ones, you'll be fine. But if I send you to the voiceovers, that is from last semester. Um, but I would say don't spend too much time on the spinal cord one just yet because I'm not a fan of the, the way I hurried through the spinal cord uh, last semester. Um, anyway, a cervical collar. If you do, um, if your patient does come in with a suspected spinal cord injury, what I'm going to tell you ED wise is that the spinal cord, um, the treatment for spinal cord injury is immobilization, just like for all fractures. The main treatment is immobilization and monitoring of the extremity that has been fractured. Well, with the spinal cord injury, the monitoring of the extremity that's been fractured is your entire rest of your body. Um, but right now, what I'm going to say is immobilization for spinal cord is the C collar. Um, we do not, uh, I'm not even sure if EMS fully neck and backs people anymore. Um, Brad, you can weigh in and all the other EMTs out there. Um, if you, um, you will get a C collar, but we in the ED pull you off of the, if you were on a backboard, um, in the ED, we will pull you off the backboard. Um, you do not have to stay on the backboard forever. The backboard is for transport only. Um, so when you see people neck and back, which is where they get the C collar and they're immobilized to a backboard, um, that will all come off in the ED. That is just to keep them stable while EMS is transporting. Um, once we get them to the ED, we remove them from the backboard, but they are still, um, yeah, it, there were so many bad side effects to, um, backboarding that, um, mostly pressure ulcers. Um, all the patients were coming in with pressure ulcers from being on the backboard. I don't know if anybody's had the pleasant experience of being on a backboard, um, but it is, um, it creates quite a bit of um, pressure ulcer formation. And we were finding that a lot of our spinal cord injuries uh, were getting pressure ulcers um, from the backboard that they were developing even in the ED. So um, yeah, they're kind of going away from it. But basically what I was teaching you guys um, was how to log roll them and how to move them um, in immobilization. Um, but the C-collar is, um, is the immobilization of the cervical spine if you are... Um, uh, you know, if you are suspected of having a C collar, we can remove the C collar to do um, adjusting fit or hygiene, you know, inspection of the neck. But when you are, have the C collar off, someone needs to manually hold the head in the neutral position. So the important thing is a lot of nurses don't believe they can remove the C collar. Um, if you don't think the C collar is on properly or you want to adjust it, you may remove the C collar, but you do have to have someone hold the neck in that neutral position so that people don't, um, so that they don't move their neck while they're in immobilization. Um, so that's one thing with the cervical collar. Um, the log roll is, um, 
the way that we turn the patients, we can turn patients. I've had many, many people like, oh, they're in spinal precautions. We can't move them. Oh, yes, we do need to move them. We need to check their back. We need to turn them side to side, keep their mobilization. They're going to be in spinal precautions for a while until they're fully cleared. And sometimes it takes an MRI to fully clear you out of um, spinal precautions and it takes a while to get an MRI. You can't usually get an MRI emergently like you can a CT scan. It takes a little while to get an MRI. So they could be in spinal precautions for up to 48 hours, and you're not going to leave a patient on their back uh, for 48 hours. So we will leave the C-collar on with removing it to um, do hygiene and things as long as someone's holding the neck. And the way that you move a patient um, in spinal precautions is by log rolling them, just like you wouldn't take a leg and pick it up and throw it if it was broken. We're not going to, we have to move the entire patient as one, um, in one pivot, I guess. Like if you've pulled people over with a sheet or a pillow um, and you are pulling them to one side, you know that their torso is twisting um, from their, their, their legs don't move the same way that their, their chest is because you're pulling them by their chest. So what we do is we move the whole body as one in one. So you are rolling like a log. Um, it does require two to three people. One person is always at the head, whether they have a collar or not. One person is always at the head. And that person um, is in charge. Yes, Brad, one, that person is in charge of the roll. And then the other two people, you see how they're crossing arms there. Um, they are doing that so that they work in tandem so that one person's not pulling the chest real hard and the other person not pulling the legs so they cross hands so basically the person at the chest is going to hold shoulders and hip and the person at the legs is going to hold hip and leg and you all move as one team on the um on the go of the um of the head holder and it's really fun i wish we could have gone to skills trauma skills we do trauma skills for half of a day um so i've got longer time to lecture because we're not doing trauma skills but we do let everybody practice log rolling and it is super fun um but basically the leader is standing there and keeping head in neutral position and when we say neutral position um i like to say nose to nuts um because we are keeping the nose in alignment with the spine basically the nose is in alignment to i mean nuts um they're in the center of the chest they're in the center of the body so we keep alignment there and you want to make sure the patient's not up in a sniffing position or has the neck down if they are um and i would have showed you a hold that you could hold um the neck in a good position actually we put our hands so if you are if you have someone in the room or you can practice later, you can practice holding their neck in a neutral position without a collar by grasping the backs of your hands onto their shoulder blades and your thumb on the front of their um, shoulder. So basically you hold both sides um, of their shoulders. You put the, your, the four fingers of your hand. I don't, you're probably all doing this with me because I'm doing it like got my hands up in the air and I'm trying to picture it. You put your four fingers under their shoulder blades. You put your thumb on top, um, and you are physically holding the patient, and then you use your forearms as a splint for their head and neck. Um, so, yeah, no, you won't forget now what neutral position is. Neutral, neck to nuts, um, nose to nuts. Keep everything straight. Um, you don't want their nose going off alignment because that means that their, um, their uh, neck is twisted. So you basically get make sure their nose is in alignment. And this is how we would hold a head if we were taking the collar off as well or doing anything. Is basically um, you will hold their head. And I don't even fully trust those C-collars um, from keeping your head from moving uh, side to side. So really getting that, that clamp on the shoulders, like basically putting your four fingers under the shoulders, putting your thumb on top, and using your forearms as a splint for the head and neck. Um, that also helps when you do the roll. The head will sit on your forearms. And um, basically, you know, if you're rolling and holding a patient in log roll position and they're trying to clean a back or whatever, the head person gets very fatigued. 
Um, but your job is <clears throat> one of the most important. And everyone, your job is to work as a team. So that's what I'm saying about sea collars. You can do it. Um, sea collars are great um, if they are well positioned, but there are a crazy amount that I have seen that are not well positioned, are causing breakdown, um, are not holding the neck. The Basically, when you are in a sea collar, you are not supposed to have your nose you know, up. You're not supposed to be in a sniffing position. You're not supposed to have your neck down towards your chin. You're supposed to be looking straight ahead, and that sea collar keeps you looking straight ahead, and you're not supposed to be able to move your head side to side in a sea collar. Um, the number of sea collars, that, and I would say if you're going to clinical, um, I would test you to look at the sea collar. Many, many of them are not in place, and so one of our jobs as a nurse is to put the sea collar in place and make sure it is positioned correctly. Um, and you would do that by taking the collar off, but having someone holding your neck uh, in that neutral position, the nose to nuts position, so that they do not turn their head while the sea collar is being adjusted. And then if we are going to turn the patient, we turn them in a log roll when they're all moving as one. It does take two to three people to do a log roll. And those two to three people are committed for the whole time that you're doing care on the patient. So that's what I'm going to point out for spinal precautions, and that's how we immobilize the spine. So we can turn them and do care to them. Um, that's not an excuse for not turning your patient. If they are in spinal precautions, you may turn them. Um, they do have wedges that you could put down their whole side, or you splint them with pillows down their entire side from their neck to their ankles to ensure that they stay as one. But we can turn and reposition a patient in spinal precautions. Um, let's talk about a little bit of fracture. So that's our big fracture, our spinal cord fracture. We would immobilize it with um, a C collar and log roll. Large bone fractures, um, our largest bones are our femur and our pelvis. So if we um, are femur or pelvis injuries, um, not only is this a broken bone, um, so, of course, cues are going to be, hey, they're broken. A lot of our pelvis cues, um, you don't really see pelvic fractures um, visibly because, uh, you know, the pelvis is a large organ. How do you think we would see a pelvic fracture, Brad? <laughs> Since you've already had training. How do you know it's unstable? Yes, Blake, good input. Um, yes, the... It's not necessarily a short leg, but the leg is not positioned appropriately. Um, yeah, the hips are off. And a lot of times with fractured pelvis, you do have a bleed. There are a lot of blood vessels in there, and you can see if the pelvis fractures like that, um, you will get broken vessels as well. And abdominal bleeding is one of the first signs. But when you go to um, move a patient, Basically, if your pelvis is fractured, the leg below that is unsteady. You can have hairline fractures. You can have a complete fracture like this. Um, they are usually diagnosed um, in combination with a CT scan as well. But I will tell you, the worse the pelvic fracture, the worse the bleeding is. And I will say my one little, my one big, well, not big. I have, I have a couple of trauma stories, but um, one of them was a woman sitting in a passenger seat with the feet up on the dashboard. And I have actually physically stopped people, I'm that lady, at stoplights and asked them to put their feet down off the dashboard. Please do not drive with your feet on the dashboard or your feet out the window um, because you will fracture your pelvis in an accident. When the, uh, you will also fracture your femurs in an accident. Um, if you are in an accident with your feet up on the dashboard and the airbag goes off, um, your entire legs are going into your abdominal cavity. So if I could just paint the picture and maybe save a life right here, right now, by telling 40 people, please don't drive with your feet up on the dashboard, um, then it will be worth it because um, that is not a pretty... Um, that is not a pretty picture. Um, multiple fractured leg bones and um, high, high risk of pelvic fractures as well. Um, so don't do that. Uh, but pelvic fractures bleed. They bleed a lot. And they are very unstable, um, very hard to splint. Um, and we're not talking EMS care here. What I am, um, our 
focus is to keep this splinted the um, the best we can. What if I'm reading? There's missed an open hip fracture because I removed everything but the underwear. Oh, Brad, you didn't do your E. Um, so anyway, um, splinting the best we can. Basically, the treatment for any fracture is immobilization. Okay. Any fracture is a mobilization. So the spinal cord, we're doing C-collar and log rolling. With any bone that is fractured, we will immobilize it the best we can. Um, they have all kinds of different things out there. Um, when we were on a road trip, my son's friend um, broke his wrist and his arm on a bike, and we used Pop-Tart boxes to splint it. Um, but basically, make a splint out of anything you can. If you suspect um, a pelvic fracture, what they'll do now, um, they have all kinds of um, uh, pelvic binders uh, for these things. But sometimes you can use um, you can use a sheet. They'll put a they'll roll the patient real quick, put a sheet, and tie it tight. Um, so anyway, the um, yeah, there's there's a lot of different ways, but the treatment is to immobilize and splint the best way. Um, my fears, <laughs> um, yeah, and no, we're not going to press down on the pelvis because even if there's a little hairline fracture on the pelvis, if you press down on the pelvis, you can make an unstable fracture. I mean, a stable fracture, an unstable fracture. So yeah, they've gone away from that. So basically the, um, move them as least as possible, which is why, um, EMS is very big on immobilization because that is the treatment for any, um, fracture really is immobilization. Um, splinting, partial casts, um, trying to get it in alignment is um, a big help. I don't know if anybody did do an ED rotation maybe in block three um, and got to see any um, alignments, but they will try to realign any, um, do they still use a traction splint? Yes, a traction splint is for large bone fractures, and the reason is, is that will help one, immobilize it, and two, try to realign it. They actually pull on the ankle a little bit, give a little traction to the ankle. And if you have a femur that is displaced, if you put um, some traction on the ankle there, then it will try to, it will pull it down and try to hopefully realign it. Um, so if you immobilize it and put some traction on it. But basically our, our goals of treatment um, are not to treat you, teach you all the different um, kinds of um, splints and, and, and binders and all kinds of things that are out there. I'm just going to tell you, immobilize to the best of your ability. And when you get to, if they're in the ED, so our double fractured patient that came into the ED that was yellow, and they're finally getting them to treatment, they will try to reduce that break or um, try to get that leg in alignment the best they can because what's happening is, is as that bone is out of alignment it is sharing blood vessels and nerves and muscle um, and causing a great deal of swelling so the more in alignment a bone is the less damage it's doing to the tissue around it um, but if you don't know what you're doing with it you can cause more damage to the tissue so Yes, like Brad says, you can't do traction with an unstable hip. So if you are not sure of the extent of the injuries, the best you can do is immobilize it. Even if that means grabbing a blanket and tucking that blanket around the patient, um, that's immobilization. So I would like you to remember off of any fracture, whether it's the spinal cord or any large bones or small bones, is immobilize it. Okay, the best you can. Um, once you get, or if you're in the ED, then what you will be doing is putting on the more appropriate splints, doing more, um, we're now into yellow and you're starting to talk about large bone fractures. If you do not have circulation issues, um, then you have time to do diagnostics, get the proper equipment, re, um, realign these bones. Um, but one of the problems with these is that they, one, if they are a large bone and they are displaced, can cause quite a bit of bleeding. Because like I said, displaced bones um, fracture the vessels around it, the nerves around it. Um, so one, they could bleed if they are open. A lot of times these bones do not break the surface and they are closed fractures. Um, if they're open fractures, though, they're getting IV antibiotics and tetanus. And I guess anyone who's been in the ED can tell you everyone gets a tetanus shot. And I have a slide on that later. Um, 
but immobilizing it is the first one. Um, and one of the things that we need to worry about, and here's a couple of, um, you know, there's an immobilization right there, probably not the best thing in the world, but they're just tying sheets around to keep this leg from moving. Um, this will keep um, hips from moving. It will keep pelvis from moving. Um, so if you can tie those legs together to something and you can see how they cushioned in between, um, this is a great job of immobilization. If you're not moving, and this isn't just for lower extremities, this will keep your femur stable. It will keep your hips stable. If you can't move your feet, you're not moving all the rest of it. Um, but one of the problems that, um, and I think, did I put it? Yes, here's our problem. Um, so you do have a risk of internal bleeding because, like I said, these broken bones um, will cause shearing of the blood vessel around them. So internal bleeding is a problem. Um, the pelvis is very vascular. And um, if you break blood vessels in the pelvis, you can have a lot of bleeding. Um, swelling of that area because you're shearing blood vessels, nerves, muscle, tissue around there, and you have a lot of swelling. We very much worry about compartment syndrome, which is where the swelling is now cutting off our blood supply to the extremity. So remember I told you your big thing is immobilization. The second thing is really monitoring that extremity for neurovascular problems. So if you have any kind of fractures, whether it's the spinal cord, the pelvis, the bones, the, you know, the legs, the arms, you will immobilize it the best you can, and you will monitor the extremities for neurovascular compromise, meaning numbness, tingling, pain, okay? Lack of circulation. You always know that when people get casts on, you have to check their cap refill and make sure that they're not getting compressed. Well, compartment syndrome is compression of the areas, the muscle areas around in the legs. And I have a picture later on. Um, but if you had a spinal cord injury, what you're monitoring for south of the injury is your whole entire body for numbness, tingling, pain, cap refill. If we have problems with these areas and they swell, they cut off circulation and feeling to the lower extremity. So we are always watching the extremity for vascular and nerve damage. Does that make sense? So immobilization and watching the extremity for damage. Um, our two broken leg guy from the passenger seat, he couldn't feel his feet. He already has some neurovascular damage to that extremity. We will continue to watch it. So he's got neuro damage to the extremity. He can't feel his feet. Does he have vascular damage as well? We'd have to check cap refill and pulses in his feet. Um, but you would still, once you got that guy out of the car, immobilize both those legs as best as possible, immobilize them, and keep monitoring for neurovascular injury. Um, so large bone fractures, they get worse faster than smaller bones. So if you have a calf injury or a radius injury, your chances of internal bleeding, hypovolemic shock, and compartment syndrome are smaller, but they're still there. Larger bones, bigger bones, um, pelvis, femurs, um, they have much higher risk of internal bleeding, hypovolemic shock, and compartment syndrome. Um, also, if um, the femur is broken, the femur and the upper bones, those, those upper leg bones, are our biggest bone marrow factories. Um, and so if a femur is broken, fat from the bone marrow can actually cause a fat embolus. So we're very concerned after... Um, femur and pelvic fractures of fat emboli um, and clot emboli. So we want to make sure that we are kind of doing DVT prophylaxis as well. So our biggest side effects from these large bone fractures and even small bone fractures to a smaller extent, bleeding, neurovascular compromise, and embolisms. Make sense? Um, one of the things I'm going to tell you about bleeding is look at how much blood the pelvic space can hold. How much blood do we have in our body? Yep. <laughs> Six liters. Um, and guess what the pelvic space can hold? So you can bleed out your entire vascular volume into your pelvis from a pelvic fracture. Um, long bones, each femur space. So if you have two broken femurs, you could drop three liters or half your blood volume into your, um, into your, into your thighs, basically. Um, 
So basically six liters. I don't know. You can get rid of that four and a half to five and a half. I, it depends on your size, how many liters of blood you have. I think six is a nice, you know, round number to remember. But basically, if you do, that's why immobilization is so important. And the neurovascular checks, if you are losing, you can swell, but you can also bleed. So some of these big bone fractures. So let's say you go in through your ABC assessment and you have weak thready pulses. Weak thready pulses throughout your radial pulse is thready. You get a blood pressure and it's 80. You don't have any abdominal trauma. You don't have any thoracic trauma. You no asymmetrical chest, no paradoxical chest, no Kerr sign, no Cullen sign, no Turner sign, no seatbelt sign, no fast scan, no deformity of the legs that you can see. Where is our concern for losing blood pressure? You're still in the C. You're still doing the secondary survey for our circulation issue. Nothing checked out thoracic. Nothing checked out abdominal. The legs seem intact. Where is our concern? The pelvis, exactly. Internal bleeding, yes, internal bleeding. But we're trying to weed down where it is. And so I want you to know that um, a pelvic fracture may not be very easily found, um, and sometimes it's found by just process of elimination. We're not, um, yeah, you died in disaster day because they didn't catch my pelvic fracture. Ugh, right after this lecture too. Um, but anyway, uh, that is something I need you to remember. A, B, C, you're not getting out of C. You've got a weak, thready pulse. Your pressure's 80. You're bleeding somewhere. So you check the chest. No, not bleeding there. You check the abdomen. No, we did the fast scan. You're not bleeding there. The next most likely cause of internal bleeding is going to be a pelvic fracture. Um, so that's where they would probably not even, they'd probably just send you to a whole body CT if you have a CT scanner and they would find the pelvic fracture there. Uh, because in, when you're in C, the, you have to find the bleeding and stop the bleeding wherever it is. Um, so really, if your patient has a pressure of 80, you're not moving out of ABC, we're not going into any secondary survey other than where the heck is this bleeding coming from? If you have a displaced femur, so let's say when we get our little boy from the passenger seat back into the ED and they're checking out those legs, they can see he's got bilateral femoral, fra femoral fractures. His legs are both displaced. He can't feel his feet. He's got bilateral femoral fractures, and his blood pressure now is 79 over 60. And your priority, so you have four choices to take this patient. Let's say this is a test question, and you can take him to CT scan. You can do his um, ample surge. You can do his ample survey. So let's see. We can take him to CT scan. We can do his ample survey. We can um, immobilize and reposition his legs. Um, or we can, I don't know, throw something else out. What would your choice be? Yay, we're going to re-immobilize him. Hopefully EMS immobilized him on the way in, but if his blood pressure is 79, um, we would immobilize we would probably try to fix that. But this is where we would now start doing fluids. He's in circulation. So I didn't give you fluids on those chances, but if you did have all those, because I wanted to make sure that you're gonna immobilize them before taking them to CT scan or doing an ample survey, because neither one of those is appropriate just yet. We know where the bleeding is. We found the bleeding. We need to stop the bleeding. The one thing that's gonna stop the bleeding is to immobilize. The other thing is that once you have a blood pressure of any problem. So if you have blood pressure problems or oxygen problems, the treatment's going to be oxygen. And if you have a blood pressure problem, give fluids. Fluids and pressors or no? And do we use cryo and ER? Okay, so um, we will give fluids and it will always be isotonic until we can get, and you will not do pressors because we know that their pressure is 79 because they've lost fluid. This is a trauma patient. He probably lost, if he's got both of his femurs broken, 
probably losing two to three liters into his femur space or into the thighs. So he is low blood pressure due to low volume, right? Because he's losing a third to half of his blood volume. So we would do lactated ringers or normal saline until we can get blood. Because he's lost blood, we should replace blood. So this is somewhere where that's a great idea. Oh, let's give them blood um, vasopressors. But vasopressors and vasodilation aren't our problem here. Um, we want to make sure that we are replacing them. If we think they've lost blood, we will replace them with blood. Because if he's lost half of his blood volume into his thighs, or even more, if they're open fractures, you can lose even more because you have no pressure to stop it, basically. Um, if you've lost that much blood volume, you've lost that much clotting factors. You've lost that much red blood cells. You've lost that much oxygen carrying capacity. You've lost all your clotting factors in your plasma. So um, yes, fluids before meds until you have a, a decent blood pressure. In a trauma patient, um, we will definitely put fluids before meds. Meds won't work without a fluid-filled system, and I like Brad's don't make Kool-Aid. Yeah, you basically have lost your blood. Giving them volume is a great way to start because we want to at least circulate what we do have around um, and get a blood pressure up, Because, but we need to replace their active red blood cells and their active clotting factors that live in plasma. So they will replace, so to get back to the cryo question, um, cryoprecipitate has our clotting factors in it, um, but so does our plasma. So I get fluids before pressure, but if they're actively bleeding out, giving blood and fluids, but how do you keep it in until the bleed stops? Does that make sense? Well, we have to, the only way to get that bleeding to stop is to try to get that leg back into alignment. Um... But sometimes we give bloods and fluids, bloods and fluids, bloods and fluids until we can find the bleeding and stop it. Um, so, yeah, you sometimes you can't keep it in until the bleeding stops. And that's where you'll see trauma bays um, with blood, blood, blood. And that's where we'll do massive transfusion on patients until they can get the bleeding to stop. So basically, yes, sometimes we will put blood and plasma and cryo into the patient and it dumps right back out onto the floor. Um, so that's where, but we are in C. We can't move on. We can't move this patient or do anything else until the circulation is somewhat stable. And that will be stopping the bleed. Um, so yes, we will replace blood, volume, and fluids until we get a decent blood pressure while we try to work on the cause of the bleeding. Um, and usually the cause of the bleeding is getting that to immobilize going in and they will actually cauterize if there is a bleeding artery or a bleeding vein. They will actually try to go in there and um, clamp those vessels, get those vessels to stop. Um, and they become, you know, which the gore of the ED trauma bay is basically that is their focus. We can't move this patient till circulation's under control, which means find the bleeding, stop the bleeding. Um, and so we will replace the blood that they're losing. If we can tell they've lost quite a bit of blood, they're going to get quite a bit of blood back. Um, we start with fluids, but we'll move to blood as soon as it's available because that's what they lost. That's what we need to replace. If we just replace it with fluid, um, and never do blood and plasma, then, um, yes, we've made Kool-Aid and what is circulating circulates, but it's not as effective. They need their clotting factors. They need their red blood cells. Um, so yes, the ED, while we are in circulation and trying to find the cause of the bleed, sometimes we do pump tons and tons and tons of blood into a patient. Um, my last trauma, my trauma that ended my career was, um, or my career in trauma or my, that was my decision to stop trauma was a patient that we, um, were down in the ED doing, um, she was a motorcycle. Um, the, the driver was DOA. She was thrown and had a traumatic arm amputation in the field, um, and came in and my job as the ICU charge down in the trauma bay was just to give fluid. 
Uh, it's my only job. I had an orientee with me, and we were giving blood. We were going through, I think we went through probably six massive transfusion coolers. We put probably 60 units of blood, you know, between blood, cryo, FFP, which you do do. You give blood, you give cryo, you give FFP, you give them in a ratio, and you just keep giving it. And I really, when you're doing that, don't even have time. Like, I couldn't even look at her. Couldn't even pay attention to what was going on. Everyone was doing little bits of it. Um, our job was the blood. We just kept infusing, infusing, infusing until we had enough of a blood pressure, enough of a blood pressure to get her to the CT scanner. No one could find um, the internal injury. Nobody knew what it was. Um, you know, we couldn't. All we were doing is giving her blood, and if we weren't giving her blood, the blood pressure would drop right out. Um, it turns out she had a torn aorta. And so after we put all these 60 units in and went to CT scan, um, it was a torn aorta, and she was pronounced there. And it wasn't until afterwards, once we were doing all this um, cleanup and everything, that um, I knew her. And she was someone that I had taught with at a different uh, school. And I never even recognized her because of the injuries and what was going on. And that's what um, killed me from trauma because my kids were just learning how to drive and um, all this stuff was going on. And um, yeah, I couldn't, I just couldn't do it anymore. And I was just old, but um, I didn't want to see my kids come in, my kids' friends come in, anybody I knew come in. And so that's what ended my trauma career is I'm like, oh, it's no longer fun and and good anymore. I, uh, I know too many people and I just, that was the end of my career. But the, um, the story though was basically no matter how much fluid we are using, the fact is, is that we were putting in. So if we put in six massive transfusions, that was probably, I don't know, 20, 30 liters of fluid. And, um, None of it helped. And of course, none of it was going to help. If she had a tear in her aorta, um, everything we put in was just getting leaked out. So um, yes, by the end of this code, basically, um, yes, was she big and swollen? And yes, she was, because all of that blood had been displaced um, out into her periphery. So I mean, the thing is, is that you do your best. Um, it is like a death sentence right away unless you keep pumping fluid in and then that heart keeps pumping the fluid you give it. Um, but basically everything you put in is getting taken out. So um, that's one of the things. But we never did get her past ABC. Um, and that's the thing is that you just do your best. You do your best. Um, but yes, the treatment for any of these things is... Um, was it the ligament on the, you know, I never even looked at the scan. I just know this CT surgeon came down and said, no, I'm not repairing that. And, um, that was the end of it. We called it after that. Um, but they did, we did keep her going until the CT was done. We found it, found the source of the bleeding and the CT surgeon was called to come in and see if he would take her. And he said that was not repairable. So I don't know where it was, but all I know is he said it wasn't repairable. And so we realized we couldn't stop the bleeding. And so that was the end of the resuscitation. But really, you do resuscitate until you can find the bleeding um, and stop the bleeding, or at least determine whether you can stop the bleeding or not. If the bleeding had been from a pelvic fracture, um, stabilizing it would have would have stayed. I think they were trying all those different things. But like I said, I didn't get a lot of chance. And you do, you get focused on what you're doing. And you don't see the big picture of what's going on around you. I didn't even know she had a traumatic amputation until we were cleaning up the room. And, um, I, oh, there's no arm. Like, there's things that you can't, you can't focus on. And really, when you're staying in ABC, um, you stay there. Um, the things we do to control circulation, if it's a long bone fracture that we can have, so on our little dude there, we would um, immobilize that, and they would give him fluids, 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 blood, 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 fluids, 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 blood, 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 until they could get that leg stable. And that might even be going to the OR to stabilize that leg or cauterizing blood vessels. But until you can stop the bleeding, 
you're just pouring um, fluids and blood into them. The other thing about it is um, avoid hypothermia. If we were giving all that blood at room temperature, the patient would be room temperature within one or two coolers of, I mean, and that blood is actually not even room temperature. The blood that comes up is cold. It comes out of a blood refrigerator. Um, So if you gave that to them straight, yes, they need blood, they need fluids, um, but you're putting in, if you put in 60 degree blood into a 90 degree patient, um, you've got now a 70 degree patient, which is a hypothermic patient. And one of my CV surgeons always told me, cold blood don't clot. And you need to be in your proper temperature range, um, 98.6, to have your platelets activate and for your clotting factors to work. The clotting cascade does not work if you are cold. Um, So this fluid that we give them all has to go through a warmer. And if you've been in the ED um, or if you've been in ICU, if you ever happen to see they have all kinds of different blood warmers and what we were using was the rapid infuser which is a it's a big huge IV pole with pressure bags at the top and all the blood goes through a warmer so what we're doing is we are giving the blood quickly but it's going through a warmer as it ends as it goes through a patient so we have to warm the fluids so that we're not dropping their temperature Um, It's something that people don't think about, but if we're giving rapidly one, two, three liters of fluid, your normal saline bags and your D5 bags are at room temperature, which is 70 some degrees. And you put enough liters or you replace half their blood volume with 70 degree fluid, um, it will eventually cool the body down and you'll send the body into hypothermia. So we want to keep the patient as warm um, as possible and warm the fluids to avoid hypothermia if we're doing rapid fluid replacement. So your patient that's in hypovolemic shock, I put it here under large bone fractures, but it can happen with thoracic fractures, it can, I mean thoracic injuries, it can happen with abdominal injuries, it can happen with pelvic injuries and with femur injuries. Um, all those injuries can cause massive hypovolemic shock, meaning we've just lost so much blood, we need to replace that blood and that blood needs to be warm, okay? We're all good. Everybody's ready to go take care of a trauma patient now. It's just give fluid, give fluid, give fluid. Stop bleeding. Um, it's very, um, very fun. Um, let's go back to just fractures in a while and talk about compartment syndrome. This is where, okay, so we've gotten out of C. We've gotten out of circulation. Our circulation's under control. We have a decent blood pressure we go back to the mainstays of immobilization, splinting, and neurovascular checks. Um, So neurovascular checks on a spinal cord injury are going to be your spinal, um, your way you're checking, you know, numbness, tingling, you're checking your circulation, and you're checking all of your um, uh, extremities for sensation. The rate of blood transfusion on med surge does not require a blood. No, if you're giving blood, slowly over three to four hours, you do not need a blood warmer. I'm talking about giving multiple liters within an hour, within 15 minutes or something. Since it's not rapid infusion, you don't need to warm it. So that's actually a good question. You're dripping it in so slowly that it absorbs the body temperature and it doesn't cause hypothermia. But if you start to be getting a couple of units in less than an hour, you might want to require a blood warmer. Um, anything that starts to get to be rapid blood infusion or rapid infusion of fluids, um, like if you're giving two to three liters, I mean, that's half the blood volume. If you're giving two to three liters in 15, 20 minutes, you're not, um, and not being warmed, that's going to drop the temperature of the patient. Um, but yes, yeah, something that's dripping in at less than, um, I would say probably two to three liters per hour um, is not going to cause hypothermia. But that's a good question. Um, compartment syndrome is where the broken bone has damaged and you can see the little, the little cross section of the leg there, how there are actually compartments. The muscles are in compartments and, um, that way if it's one of those interior compartments there, I don't know if you can blow up these pictures there. If it's that internal compartment, everything, and that's where the blood flow, your lymph system, your nerves are all traveling down in between the muscles there. So if that muscle in the internal compartment then swells, 
it's going to cut off blood flow and nerve uh, flow to that lower extremity or to below that area. So if you end up with compartment syndrome, the signs and symptoms of that are decreased pulses, pallor, so decreased pulses, pallor, paresthesias, which means numbness, tingling, um, and sometimes pain, pain not relieved by medications. Um, so the five P's are over here, pulsenses, poor cap refill, pallor, paresthesias, and pain. If you have any of those things on your feet or uh, below the extremity, so if you broke your humerus or your ulna and you started having pulselessness of your radial um, pallor, paresthesias, then you have to worry that this muscle is swelling to the point that you have compartment syndrome. Um, they do have to put in a pressure reading to see if you have compartment syndrome. And the treatment for that is actually slicing through and opening up that compartment to swell, to allow it to swell, um, which is why when you first get a fracture, they don't put you in a full closed cast at first, usually. Um, they'll put you in an open cast. If it's a large um, injury that they're expecting a lot of swelling, they're going to put you in a flexible cast, maybe a splint with an ACE wrap around it so that you can swell. Because if you have swelling under an enclosed structure, you could cut off circulation. So we're going to allow room to swell. Um, so if you have compartment syndrome, a fasciotomy is the treatment for compartment syndrome. And that's where they actually slice open and allow things to swell out so that there's no compression of the nerves and the blood vessels. Okay, little break. Want a little break or should we just keep going? Okay, I got two keep goings. Okay, you can always go away and take a break. That's the nice, that's the nice thing about online. I don't, I don't see you up. You're not disturbing the class. You can just go take a break. Um, we're going to talk about heat-related emergencies. So we kind of talked about our big um, thoracic trauma, abdominal trauma, large bone trauma. Those are the things that are going to give us um, hypovolemic shock, keep us in our ABCs. Um, and then if you get through your ABCs, um, then we can worry about that leg and making sure that it stays um, perfused and doing our neurovascular checks on any fractured extremity. All right, so now we're going to go into heat-related injuries since we live in Arizona. Um, probably see quite a bit of these in the ED. Um, know the difference between heat exhaustion and heat stroke. Um, this is something that's probably good for your general, you know, first aid knowledge, but heat exhaustion can be recovered. Heat stroke is a medical emergency. So the word stroke should cause to clue you into emergency. Heat exhaustion is something that needs treatment, but is not a medical emergency unless it's not treated. So know the difference between the two. And the difference between the two is with heat exhaustion, we still have enough blood volume to cool ourselves. With heat stroke, we are not cooling ourselves any longer, okay? So heat exhaustion means you might need some assistance to get cool, but you are still cooling yourself. Whereas in a heat stroke, you have, your body has lost the ability to cool itself down and their temperature keeps rising and rising and rising. Um, a couple of more. So the treatments for them um, are a little bit different. Heat exhaustion is someone that maybe is out there. You've probably all had heat exhaustion. I think anyone that lives in Arizona has had heat exhaustion. You recognize things not going that great. You're sweating a lot. Um, you're weak. You're fatigued. You have a headache. You may be, you're losing fluids because you're sweating, but you are still sweating. So it is a good sign. Not sweating, bad sign. So if you are still sweating, you can recover from heat exhaustion. You're not going to feel good, but you can recover very easily by cooling yourself down, getting rehydrated. Okay, Heat exhaustion is just allow yourself, you just replace the fluids that you've lost trying to cool. Your body is cooling by sweating. And so it is sweating to produce evaporation and cool. The problem with heat stroke is that you have either sweated all your volume away or you didn't have enough volume to start with. Um, your body can't self-cool. The only way it cools is by sweating. Um, and, you know, we, that's our cooling reflex. So if we have lost so much volume that we can't sweat anymore, 
then your body has lost its cooling ability and you will temperature will rise and rise and rise. Your temperature could rise up to 107 degrees, um, which will cause brain damage. So since the body cannot self-cool, we will have to provide that evaporative cooling for the body. So heat exhaustion is just getting someone into the shade, out of the heat, and hydrating. You can help them evaporate by giving them some water, but they can rehydrate. They're still conscious. Heat stroke patients will, um, the skin is hot and dry. They're not sweating anymore, and their temperature is rising and rising and rising and rising. And so now we have to evaporatively cool for them. The treatment is to get cool water on this body, damp sheets, towels, ice packets, cooling blankets, and basically try to get this patient cooled down to prevent any further injury from the high temperature. Any questions on that? Why don't we give fluids to drink in heat stroke? This patient's um, at high risk. You can give fluids, but basically the, the quicker cooling is going to be getting them evaporatively cool. Our, our fever is the concern here. When you are in heat stroke, um, your temperature's already elevated up to 103, 104. Um, it's a fever emergency is really what heat stroke is. And so our first, uh, so fluids are definitely on there um, as an intervention, but our first interventions are to cool the patient. So cool IV fluid, <clears throat> we really hesitate on heating and cooling IV fluid because that causes a lot of internal damage. Um, so we can heat it, but it has to be heated with a regulator. We can cool it, um, but you, it would be better and you're not necessarily dehydrated. And you're usually, you are dehydrated in heat stroke because you've probably lost your ability to cool because you are dehydrated. You've probably sweated away all of your, um, extra fluid or you would be sweating. Um, so yes, you do need fluid replacement. But um, the emergency is getting the temperature down. So the difference in treatment is basically your first interactions. In heat exhaustion, your first interaction are going to be remove them and hydrate them. With heat stroke, your first interactions are going to be cooling them. And then you can give IV fluid. So does that make sense a little bit? Yes, IV fluids are important and we should do it. Heat stroke is tacky and bounding pulse. Um, it depends on, they're going to be definitely tachycardic because we're trying to circulate around, but they've lost a lot of their volume from going through, like nobody really just goes to heat stroke. You go through heat exhaustion, sweat everything away, and then you're ending up in heat stroke. So not so much a bounding pulse because you've lost a lot of your volume. So the book said lavage with cool fluid. Like lavage what, though? Your body or your lungs or your, flu or your blood vessels? Lavage means to pour water on. So you could do something down the NG tube if you have an NG tube. Basically, we are trying to get their temperature down. And IV fluids is not our first choice to get the temperature down. Our first choice is to evaporatively cool the patient. So yes, a cool bath would work. Um, you could douse them with buckets of water. Um, you could put on damp sheets with fans over them. Um, we need to get the temperature down. So you know how you say in A, B, C? Uh, we're kind of in C here, okay? Um, this is circulation. We don't have a lot of circulation. We need to get this temperature down. What this temperature is doing is it's frying your body. Um, and so we will put fluids in. And I would say probably if you're treating this in the ED, they would be giving fluids in addition to doing all of this. But in the nursing world, they want you to differentiate the fact that heat stroke, you have a temperature that is frying the inside of your, your internal organs. It's frying your brain. It's frying your heart. It's frying your lungs. It's frying your muscles. Get that temperature down. Is there worry of cooling the patient too fast and putting them in shock? Um, possibly. Um, the thing is, though, is if you cool them fast from 105 and you cool them down to 98, that's not going to put them in shock. That's going to make them normal. Um, if we cooled them down to 70, yes, that would be pretty bad. 
Um, but what you're doing is you are, I don't think it's, it's going to take a lot to get a body to cool from 105 down to something hypothermic. Um, so I think what they're doing is they're just saying your first steps and if you have to choose between things on a test, um, which I'm going to make sure IV fluids isn't there because you can make an argument that IV fluids will cool you. Um, but what NCLEX and nursing and want you to know is that the treatment for heat stroke, if you walk up on your kid that's been outside playing football or whatever, or, you know, you're at a football game and somebody goes down and they are not sweating, you don't have IV fluids right there the best thing to do for them is going to be to cool them. So yes, dump water on them, put fans on them, um, ice packs. You are trying to get the temperature down. So does that make sense? I really wanted to kind of differentiate. Whereas if somebody goes down and they're still sweaty, um, then you can rehydrate them. That would be your first treatment. Give them Gatorade, give them cool water, get them in the shade. But if they have gone down and they're dry and hot to the touch, that, I mean, you can tell they already have a fever, then our job is to cool them, and you will dump cool water on them, and they will be much more lethargic and um, almost towards unconsciousness because their brain is frying. It's too hot. Same reason that a temperature of, you know, over 105 is an emergency um, to get down. Um, you know, our body can tolerate temps of 102, 103, but once it starts to get to be above 105, and you don't have a thermometer on you, um, but if the patient is dry and hot, you're going to cool them first. If they are sweaty and dizzy, you'll rehydrate them first. Okay? So we're kind of just talking first aid here. Um, I won't make you choose between IV fluids with heat stroke. But yes, IV fluids would work. Okay? And I love the idea. If you have IV fluids available, go ahead and give them. But if you're doing first aid at a softball field or a football field or something like that, you don't have IV fluids right there in front of you. And that's the difference. Sweaty, rehydrate, not sweaty, cool. Okay? So we're just kind of going to put that out there for heat stroke and heat exhaustion. Um, then we go to cold, which we're not going to see very often here in town. Um, and, of course, you might see it in Flagstaff in the winter. Um, but we're going to talk about the difference um, in hypothermias and just basically going through um, the difference. There are, there's severe, there's moderate, and there's mild. Um, we can be mildly hypothermic. Um, somebody said what happens, uh, I think, what were we talking about? We're talking about falling asleep in the pool. And if you fall asleep in the pool, um, you could end up mildly hypothermic because your body will eventually equilibrate to its temperature around it and the pool water, well, maybe not in the heat of the summer, but if the pool water is 70 degrees and you're 98 degrees, you'll eventually kind of equilibrate around to be in the low 90s, high 80s, and you can become hypothermic falling asleep in a pool. Um, so there is that, I mean, maybe that's a thing, but basically mild hypothermia generally is taken care of by the own body, and so the body has a temperature regulating system. When you get too hot, you sweat. When you get too cold, you shiver. So the body takes care of its, its own my, mypothermia by shivering, and that will warm you back up. So mild hypothermia isn't usually treatable or anything. Your body's shivering. Um, you may be lethargic. You're confused. This is your first stage of something's not quite right. Um, eventually, though, as the body gets colder and colder and shivering hasn't worked, then you go into moderate hypothermia which is where you get a slowed respiratory rate, your blood pressure drops, um, you end up in some acidosis, you can get hypovolemic, fluids start shifting, and the shivering disappears. And then severe hypothermia is almost death-like. Um, so this is why people that are pulled out of frozen um, rivers and frozen um, lakes are still alive because they've progressed through to severe hypothermia. And severe hypothermia is... Um, you are death-like state, um, severely s s profound bradycardia. They can have heart rates in the 20s. Um, they may be, um, have fixed and dilated pupils. They may um, have agonal respirations. But if they are hypothermic, um, you have to warm the patient to pronounce death. You can have a completely asystolic um, apneic patient that they're doing CPR on, 
that as they warm, stuff comes back. So you're not dead until you're warm and dead, and that's why they can't pronounce death until you... Um, so Cardin's had a big one. Were they a, a drowning? Or how did they get that cold? At Cardin's. Sorry, I'm putting you on the spot and making you type fast. Yeah, usually it is drowning. And so if the patient, um, if you have drowned and you're underwater and you're not found right away, your body will equilibrate to that pool temperature. Um, and, you know, severe hypothermia is less than 86 degrees. I mean, a summer pool could easily be 86 degrees. It's probably a little warmer. Um, but, I mean, you drop into a 60-degree lake, you're going to equilibrate out at less than 86 very quickly. Whereas in a pool, even a 70-degree pool, um, you can become hypothermic within probably five minutes. Um, so anyway, basically, if you are severely hypothermic, they do have to warm you. So you can't call the code. You have to continually... Um, CPRing or trying to revive the person until you can get them warmed as well. So we would probably give them the treatments for hypothermia to get them warm. So we'll talk about the treatments of hypothermia. One of the other things I think, um, if you remember from the cardiac lecture, um, we will actually induce hypothermia on some people. Um, so there is therapeutic hypothermia um, that the hospitals do do after heart attacks, and now they're saying after um, stroke or um, brain injuries as well. Um, what we do is we put the body hypothermic, we cool them to a temperature of um, 80 to 93, so we're making them cold to get the effects of the bradycardia, the slowed respiratory rate, the slowed body um, without causing severe hypothermia. So we regulate the hypothermia. It does allow the body to rest. So a heart that's had a massive heart attack, bradycardia, slowed respiratory rate, slow metabolic rate is only going to help a heart that has died. Um, and, a, and a heart that has died and come back. That's why hypothermia is one of the treatments for return of circulation. Because if the heart has died for a prolonged period of time and has come back, we don't want to stress it anymore with any of the... Um, the body's working, so we slow the body down so that it doesn't have to work so hard so the heart can rest. And they're finding that hypothermia is possibly a treatment um, for brain injuries as well because the brain's so busy trying to fix the rest of the body that slowing down the body allows the brain to rest. So they're using hypothermia, therapeutic hypothermia, to get those conditions of bradycardia, slowed respiratory rate, slowed metabolic rate, um, to allow our important organs to rest because our brain and our heart never shut down unless we do something to do so. Um, so we will do therapeutic hypothermia, which will put them in that range of 30 to 34 degrees. Um, and we actually sometimes will even keep people at 35, 36 degrees um, if they're not shivering um, because we don't want people, if we are putting them in hypothermia, we don't want them shivering because that's outdoing our purpose. Our purpose is let the body rest, and if the body is shivering, um, then they are not resting. So what we do is we cool them to the point where they stop shivering, and that's their therapeutic hypothermia. Um, we don't let them go as cold as severe hypothermia. So what do we do if the patient comes into us hypothermic or we have made them hypothermic and we want to return them to regular temperature? How do you think we would do this? You can move on to the next slide and cheat, I guess, but how are we going to warm this patient? Some of you may have seen this. Is it getting choppy? Oh, I'm sorry. I wonder if I should switch over to my... All right, hang on. Somebody probably put on Netflix again. 